Gunter, uh, thank you, Ben, for joining us, and greetings to everyone from wherever you may be. I'm sitting in Bloomington, Indiana, on a bright and sunny fall day. I hope it's as good where you are. What's not good, of course, is that anti-Semitism continues to accelerate. Uh, it's been on the rise for a couple of decades at least now, um, to the degree something altogether outlandish happens, like Kanye West's recent statements or, Ka or Kyrie Irving's statements, it gets into the news. Often, however, uh, the mainstream presses don't pay as much attention to uh, hostility to Jews as they should. The Jewish media, thanks to people like Ben Cohen and other colleagues, are on top of these things all the time, and one learns a great deal from reading them. Uh, we all remember that in January of this year, uh, a guy flew into the States from the United Kingdom, went to Colleyville, Texas, and took the rabbi and some of his congregants hostage by gunpoint in a really uh, terrible incident. Um, the New York Times initially covered that on page 17. In other words, only in the back pages. The FBI at the time said that it was not an incident that involved the Jewish community. The statement later recounted. Why do I bring that to your attention now? We know what we know according to what we learn from the news. And the news takes many different forms. <laughs> Some of it reliable and sound, some of it askance, some of it altogether wrong. And today we have the great advantage <coughs> of hearing one of our leading journalists, Ben Cohen, sort some of that out for us. I'm a regular reader, as are many of you, I'm sure, of his columns in the Allgemeiner. Um, He's outstanding in the coverage that he gives to anti-Semitism and political extremism in many parts of the world. He also writes a weekly column for JNS.org, which gets syndicated to something like 100 media outlets. He appears frequently in other media as well. In 2014, Ben published his very good book, Some of My Best Friends, A Journey Through 21st Century Anti-Semitism. In 2017, with a colleague, he co-edited The Norman Jerris Reader, and he continues to write constantly on some of the most pressing issues of the day, and always in a very well-informed, critically astute manner. We'll learn lots from you today, Ben. We appreciate your joining us. I'm now happy to hand over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Alvin. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all of you from uh, an unusually humid uh, borough of Queens in, in New York City. Uh, Alvin, I'm very grateful to you for that generous introduction, but I also want to record my gratitude to Iska uh, more generally, um, as a professional journalist who, as you noted, unfortunately, uh, I write about anti-Semitism pretty much on a, on a daily basis. I find that the research and the insights that come out of ISCA are peerless, and I really want to record my gratitude uh, ultimate, uh, first of all, as professionally for, for the work that you and Gunther uh, and the other scholars at, at ISCA do. Um, in terms of my um, presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of my presentation here today, uh, I'm going to essentially divide this into two parts. I'm going to say something about media coverage of anti-Semitism in general. And then in the second half of my talk, I want to look at a case study, uh, specifically the Documenta Art Festival in Germany. Uh, which took place between June and September of this year, and which I'm sure many of you will know was enveloped uh, in a series of, of quite ugly scandals around anti-Semitism. Uh, 
Uh, and for various reasons, I think that that is uh, the most uh, mature and uh, pertinent story out of the myriad stories that have, have emerged this year on anti-Semitism. And that's why I'm going to uh, look at it in more detail. Um, uh, I'm not going to be, I should say, discussing whether particular outlets on the left or the right are anti-Semitic, uh, nor am I going to be paying particular attention to what appears on the opinion pages. What I'm interested in here is in how is in anti-Semitism as a challenge for news gathering and how the world's major news organizations report this issue, not in their commentary sections, but in their news sections, because, of course, uh, anti-Semitism is appearing both in its own right and as an element in other stories with much greater frequency uh, in multiple different contexts. Uh, and the sheer volume, I would say, of stories is now unprecedented. You know, when, when Hitler in 1935 uh, introduced the Nuremberg Laws, uh, there were more or less about a thousand articles in the American uh, press. Uh, on that subject. That's according to research uh, done by the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. This year alone, this year, the Documenta Festival alone generated 58,000 more or less articles on. Now, I'm not suggesting by that numerical contrast that an art show has greater historical significance than possibly the greatest act of, of, of racial discrimination in modern history. But uh, I think what is significant about that contrast is that it speaks to the layers of additional content that are coming out of specialist websites, out of uh, uh, and, and on social media platforms uh, that are sometimes enlightening us, very often confusing us about the nature of this of this problem. Um, so I would say uh, that there are really four immediately notable aspects about the way that the world's major news organizations, so I'm talking CNN, Fox News, the BBC, the New York Times, uh, that's just in the English language. There are, there are basically four immediately notable aspects to how they are covering this problem. And I wanna go here to my first slide. So bear with me just a second. Um, right, so basically, um, Gunter, can, is, is that up? I, I think that's up, yeah, okay. Uh, so there are, I would say, there are these four key characteristics. I'd say firstly, that anti-Semitism is now very much a story that lives on front pages or, or home pages. Uh, in other words, it may have been, and it still is in some cases, a story for the back pages. Sometimes it doesn't get reported, but more and more you find that instances of anti-Semitism uh, and particularly violent crimes involving anti-Semitism are reported and are reported pretty prominently. But I think, of course, what is what is most significant here is that in the last decade, I would say, anti-Semitism has gone from being a specialized news story. One, for example, that is related to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and how the Israeli-Palestinian conflict bounces out of its own boundaries uh, into our territories. Uh, it's gone from that to being a major uh, factor in the culture wars. Uh, anybody who wasn't persuaded of that two weeks ago, I think will have been persuaded of that uh, thanks to Kanye West and his various outbursts. So the fact is, is that that uh, celebrity culture um, has uh, embraced in some ways the the tropes of anti-Semitism in a way that we haven't seen uh, before. And so that's when, of course, the world's greatest hip hop star comes out with this kind of garbage. It is going to become uh, homepage news and it's going to give anti-Semitism a profile in the media that that even with all the outrages of the last 20 years, it hasn't yet had. Related to that, of course, is, is, is the frequency of mentions. Anecdotally, I can tell you that I go through, um, uh, you know, my, part of my morning routine is to go through the world's press and see what's being reported about, about, about anti-Semitism, political extremism uh, more generally. And I can tell you that in each of the languages that I search in, and that tends to be, you know, German, French, 
uh, Dutch, uh, increasingly they, these days Russian and Ukrainian as well. Um, I'm finding uh, four or five uh, stories on average a day that either mention anti-Semitism or are focused uh, entirely on anti-Semitism. So the frequency of mentions is also increasing uh, precipitously. I think the third important aspect is the appearance of anti-Semitism uh, in a range of thematic and geographical contexts. What I mean by that is that anti-Semitism uh, has been an element of stories around the COVID-19 pandemic, a very important element actually of the stories around the COVID-19 pandemic. It's also been an element in media coverage of the war between Russia and Ukraine. It's even been an element in our coverage, in, in media coverage of the ongoing and worsening uh, global economic and, and energy crisis. And as we head into the winter, uh, there is every expectation that that is a trend uh, that will that will continue. And of course, you're seeing these stories in a range of different countries. Uh, you know, so as I said, on a daily basis, you can be reporting on anti-Semitic incidents in, in the UK, in France, in Germany, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and I think what this shows as well, what the graph, what media coverage graphically underlines is the way that anti-Semitism has been globalized and the fact that it shares similar uh, tropes and similar strategies uh, uh, across, across national borders. Uh, that is something I think we have been aware of that as, as, as scholars and observers of anti-Semitism, certainly over the last 20 years. I think the media has now, has now woken up to that as well. And so therefore the, the stakes of, of this issue, just by dint of that, uh, are transformed. I think finally, uh, there's a very interesting issue as to the extent to which media outlets understand the thematic consistency between the current expressions of anti-Semitism that we're seeing, the present outbursts, and the much older historical traditions that they build on. And I think, you know, give or take, there that, that awareness is there. Certainly, if you look at the coverage uh, of the uh, COVID-19 uh, demonstrations, the, the, the demonstrations mounted by people opposed to vaccination, masking, social distancing, uh, all those wonderful public health measures that we, we lived with for, uh, for, for, for two years. Uh, uh, you will find that many of those media outlets were sufficiently aware of medieval anti-Semitism to cite the Black Death and the medieval response to the, 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 the response of, of, of the church and other institutions in the medieval period to the Black Death, to this kind of um, retrograde social movement that emerged around uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, so those are the, uh, those are the four immediate, as I said, the four immediately uh, notable aspects uh, of anti-Semitism in our in, in media coverage of anti-Semitism in our in our current time, um, there is of course the question about why I'm beginning my my analysis in 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 2020, and I think that there are there are two reasons for that. I think firstly it's practical. You know, uh, if I was to go through the last 20 years of media coverage of anti-Semitism, we would be here for considerably longer than one one afternoon. Uh, so I think for reasons of brevity, uh, a two year framework makes sense. But I think more substantively, uh, 2020 and the various events around the various news events around anti-Semitism in 2020 uh, underscored for me, at any rate, that there are four distinct types of anti-Semitism simultaneously in operation. And these four types are manifesting in, in the media coverage. So let me again share my screen so I can explain what I mean by that. Oh, I'm sorry, I've gone to the wrong slide there. So now you can all see, I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, here we go. Um, right, so I have, um, I've got an article coming out in a, a forthcoming edition of the Journal of Israel Affairs, where I break down what I see as these four expressions of anti-Semitism. I don't really want to spend too much time um, on the analytical conceptual dimensions of all of this. What I'd like to do briefly is just list these categories for you and then talk about the kinds of stories that fit into each category. 
what I would emphasize at the outset, though, is that, uh, you know, a lot of these stories can cut across different categories. So COVID-19 is a good example of, of neo-traditional anti-Semitism, and I'll say what that is in a second, uh, but it's also a good example, an ex excellent example, in fact, of the, the phenomenon of, of Holocaust abuse. And both these forms, both these expressions of anti-Semitism have been picked up extensively in media coverage. So neo-traditional anti-Semitism, what do I mean by that? Essentially, it's the revival of early Christian and medieval, but pre-Zionist tropes about Jews. And I think there are two main aspects to this. Firstly, the notion of Jews as poisoners of the physical health of surround, the surrounding society. And second, the notion of Jews as poisoners of the spiritual, social, political health of the surrounding society. Of course, they work hand in hand, in tandem, they overlap quite significantly. So what are some of the examples of, of new stories that reflect this revival of, of traditional anti-Semitism, this neo-traditionalism? The COVID-19 pandemic uh, is the obvious one. Uh, to quote the notorious uh, GDL, the so-called Goyim Defense League, every single aspect of the COVID-19 agenda is Jewish. Um, and that has been a meme that has spread across social media and was very much picked up um, in, 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 in media coverage, uh, particularly actually in, in, in France, uh, where there were some fairly shocking uh, examples of uh, Jews being blamed, uh, of classic anti-Semitic conspiracy theory, theories being invoked to explain both the nature of uh, the the the, the COVID-19 pandemic, the, the reason that, that we were suffering from this, but also uh, conspiracy theories about the vaccination effort uh, uh, as well. Uh, and so, for example, you know, one of the many uh, examples that I could I could pluck was the appearance of a former army general, Dominique Delawarde, on primetime French TV, where he he basically goaded the presenter and teased the presenter and said, we all know who it is that is behind this pandemic. He never said the word Jew. It was a very loud dog whistle. And in some ways, unfortunately, that was typical of what we were hearing uh, around the pandemic, and it 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 penetrated the media um, quite quite definitively. But the COVID pandemic story wasn't the only story reflecting these tropes. I would say the Documenta Art Festival was another example, uh, and I'm going to be talking about that in more detail. I'd say that the phenomenon of rising hate crimes was another example, in the sense that uh, uh, violence is 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 now very much. Uh, an integral part of anti-Semitism's strategy these days. Uh, and I think as well, the, the, the Kanye West story in its own right is worth citing here. Uh, somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't recall that Kanye said anything about Israel or Zionism in his latest outbursts. These were entirely uh, crude, again, medievalist tropes about Jews, including one where I believe that he accused his Jewish doctor of deliberately misdiagnosing his mental health problems. Uh, you know, uh, sh we, we, the, the echoes of history are unmistakable in that context. You know, one thinks of, of Joseph Stalin and, and, and the doctor's plot. Uh, Stalin uh, accused his Jewish doctors of doing uh, much the same thing. Uh, so that's, that's neo-traditional anti-Semitism. It's the old style crude anti-Semitism that perhaps rather naively we thought we'd gotten rid of. And a glance at the news pages these days will show you that it is sadly very much alive and well. Uh, the second category that I identify is, is anti-Zionism. And I think this is important because what, what the media coverage has demonstrated, I think inadvertently, I don't think journalists go out, good reporters don't go out to prove a political point. They simply seek to reflect truth and and reality. And the truth and the reality about anti-Zionism that was reflected certainly in the coverage last year of the war in Gaza in May and the angry demonstrations, to quote the title of my talk, the riots that uh, accompanied uh, it, it, it around the world that accompanied uh, uh, that, that, that conflict, we saw that anti-Zionism took a violent turn. And this it was fascinating to me. I'm sure it's fascinating to many of you. 
you know, we had, I think for 20 years, we've been dealing with, it's not been pleasant dealing with anti-Zionism, but it has been relatively civilized in that our disputes have been uh, discursive. I don't remember, if you think back to the 2008 controversy around the book, The Israel Lobby, I don't remember really anybody getting beaten up in a debate about uh, about what Ms. Heimer and Wall were saying. That is absolutely not the case now. And we saw several violent uh, attacks on Jews that were a direct consequence of these demonstrations last year. And they were all, as I said, uh, 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 I, I was pleasantly surprised to see how extensively they were reported. There, was, there wasn't an attempt to brush them under the carpet. Some of the examples that, that, that people on this call might remember was the attack uh, in Los Angeles on a group of Jewish diners who I think were sitting outside a Japanese restaurant. And they were set upon by uh, a group of very large men, all of whom were wearing uh, kefirs and screaming uh, the slogan, Free Palestine. Uh, we saw another uh, Free Palestine outrage here in New York City, uh, a young Jewish man who uh, happened to be walking through Times Square in broad daylight on a weekday with his Yamal Quran during a, a demonstration, uh, an anti-Zionist demonstration against Israel, uh, was uh, uh, savagely beaten um, in broad daylight uh, by, by six or seven uh, different men. And there are numerous other uh, examples. I, I think personally, the one that I found the most chilling, and Gunther may also remember this, there was a demonstration in the German city of Gelsenkirchen, and uh, I saw some of the uh, video of that, uh, and the video was 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 widely posted in in German media outlets. And essentially, you saw a group of mainly young uh, demonstrations, uh, demonstrators jumping up and down, and chanting in a celebrating way the words "Scheiße Juda," shitty Jews. Um, so that again, those demonstrations were an integral part of the media coverage of the of the Gaza conflict of of last year. In a way, I think that they were not during two thousand eight and nine and two thousand and fourteen, the two previous major conflagrations that we saw in Gaza. Some of you might remember in two thousand and fourteen there was even a riot outside a synagogue in Paris uh, during uh, Shabbat services. That did not get. The, um, the volume of media coverage that, that these attacks in, in 2021 did. So there is definitely, I think, uh, some kind of a, a, a change in awareness on the part of, of uh, newsroom editors in terms of deciding to report on, on anti-Semitism. Uh, some of the other stories around anti-Zionism that, that perhaps we might not have expected to see 10 years ago and that we're seeing now, the various uh, attempts to institute anti BDS legislation, both in the states of the Union over here, I think something like 30 states in the United States now have anti BDS legislation, but also increasingly in Europe, where pro Israel parliamentarians have introduced the tried to introduce this type of legislation. Generally, there has been some pickup in the media. So in 2019, for example, when the Bundestag, the German parliament passed a resolution labeling BDS as anti-Semitic. That was very widely reported in, 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 in Germany, in, in Bild and in other newspapers. Uh, and, and similarly, more recent initiatives, um, there was an initiative by the head of the city government of Madrid in Spain recently. She was talking about trying to introduce new measures through the municipality to combat anti-Semitism. And outlawing BDS would be one of those. Again, that that um, I'm not commenting on you know, whether that is a sensible plan. I'm simply observing that that, that proposal uh, was, was pretty widely picked up uh, in, in, in the Spanish press. And, and then, of course, uh, another example is the current uh, United Nations uh, uh, Commission of uh, Inquiry uh, into, as usual, just Israel and the Palestinians. Um, and you may have seen uh, that uh, the U.S. State Department expressed concern about 10 days ago about the problem, the issue of double standards. And that that comment was was pretty widely picked up. So, again, I think there is not necessarily greater sympathy, but there is greater awareness of the kinds of concerns that Israel's defenders raise. Uh, and so I think it's significant that we're now seeing in mainstream media outlets this charge that we've been making since at least 
1975 where the UN passed the Zionism is racism resolution that there is a a, a really quite heinous system of double standards in operation at the UN uh, when it comes to Israel. Uh, category number three uh, is is Holocaust abuse. Again, the pandemic uh, was a good example of that. Uh, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, I mean, the thing about anti-Semites, I guess, is they don't really worry about logic or, or consistency. At the same time as blaming Jews for the pandemic and for this uh, dastardly vaccine that was really going to poison us, uh, they also... Uh, many of the many of the COVID co the, the the COVID idiots or the COVID skeptics, whatever you want to call them, decided to appropriate the victimhood of the Holocaust. And this was really, I think, for me personally, this this was this was what I found most difficult to stomach when I was writing about. That. I would frequently have to go for a five minute walk to calm down when I saw when I saw what what was what was manifesting on 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 the streets. But uh, uh, essentially, what happened was that um, on these demonstrations, there was a very con concerted attempt to appropriate the physical symbols of the Nazi Holocaust uh, and transpose them onto these fabricated concerns about, about the pandemic. Uh, and the most tangible example of that was the appropriation of the Judenstern, the, the, the Jew star that the Nazis compelled Jews to wear on their outer, outer clothing in, in the occupied territories of, of Europe. Uh, but of course, in this case, you still had the Star of David's shape, but the the um, instead of saying Judah, it said not vaccinated. Um, and in other words, the the attempt here was to was was to argue that uh, we, as people who are refusing not vaccination, um, we will our fate will be the same as those of the Jews uh, under under the Nazis. So this was a a, 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 a pretty grotesque example. Of, of Holocaust abuse. It wasn't a fringe phenomenon. One of the points that, that really came through in German media coverage of this phenomenon was that the city of Munich uh, in 2020 actually banned the display of the Judenstern at these demonstrations because the problem was basically getting out of hand. Um, as with the pandemic, uh, the, the Gaza story is an example of anti-Zionism. Uh, it's also an example of Holocaust abuse. Again, numerous comparisons being made between Israel uh, and Nazi Germany, and often those comparisons getting picked up and reported. Uh, but there are two other, at least two other stories that have involved Holocaust abuse. Most recently, the Russia-Ukraine, um, the invasion of, of, of Ukraine by Russia, uh, and the canard put out by the Putin regime that the democratically elected Zelensky government is somehow a, a Nazi government. And what was interesting was when Jews uh, around the world and the state of Israel reacted with a, with a mixture of skepticism and disgust to these claims, uh, the Russian tone immediately started to get nastier. And in June, we had Sergei Lavrov, uh, Putin's foreign minister, uh, coming out with these uh, appalling comments about Hitler having had uh, Jewish blood. So that anti-Semitism that we know has never left the Kremlin and has, has been there in, in Tsarist times and in communist times is still very much present there. Um, and uh, the issue of, 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 of Russian anti-Semitism uh, as a factor in, in the Ukraine war is, is increasingly something you find not just in the, in the Jewish press, obviously the Algemeiner, we've covered it uh, pretty widely, but you see it in the, in the general mainstream press as well. And then the final example uh, is, I, I, I've specified here the Holocaust legislation in, in Poland, but actually in some ways this is a, a pan-European uh, phenomenon uh, of uh, basically... Uh, it is particularly the case in countries where you have nationalist governments or ultra nationalist governments in power. Uh, there is a concerted attempt by governments to uh, claim the victimhood of the Holocaust for them for themselves. So, you know, in Poland now, the official line is we lost three million Polish citizens of Jewish origin and three million Polish citizens of non Jewish origin. And within that rubric, um, and what's what's significant about the Polish case is this attempt to uh, criminalize um, the research of by by reputable historians into collaboration 
uh, into the phenomenon of collaboration between the Polish population under occupation and the Nazi authorities. And so within, within that, that has been an explosive issue in Poland. And so therefore an opportunity again for crude Holocaust abuse to make itself felt, to get expressed on social media and to then get reported by news organizations. Uh, final category here is, is anti-Judaism. Uh, that I think I would say is probably the least significant in terms of this presentation. What I mean by anti-Judaism are basically legislatives, uh, legislative attempts to either restrict or ban some of the core rituals of Judaism. Uh, most obviously shita, the ritual slaughter of animals. That is actually uh, a, a practice that is prescribed now in many countries in, Euro in Europe. And in the last year, we've seen uh, courts in both Greece and Belgium upholding uh, restrictive measures on shita. And both of those court decisions being reported extensively in the press. And I think it's significant uh, that a, a story that really doesn't affect the vast majority of people reading it, you know, because the, the Jewish community in Belgium is, sp is small and the Jewish community in Greece is tiny. And that's really the only community that has a practical concern about the availability of, of kosher food. Nonetheless, and I think for, for, for profoundly historical reasons, uh, news organizations understand the significance of these measures and, and, and they report them. Um, so, as I said, you have these four expressions of anti-Semitism and you have a range of stories that fit within and across these categories. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, this list here is, is not exhaustive and I'm sure many of you uh, listening have, have thought of, 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 of some of your own stories that would fit into, into that, that you've seen in the news over the last couple of years that would fit into one of these uh, categories. Um, so having established that as, as, as some kind of, of, of context, I want to, to shift now to, to looking at, at Documenta. I, I realize that we're a little bit pressed for time, so I'm going to try my best to do this uh, uh, quickly. Um, and I'm just gonna share my screen again. Okay, sorry about this slightly inept handling here. Okay, so um, I want to really I want to talk talk for the remaining time about Documenta, um, and I'm going to present it to you in the form of a timeline and how the media coverage uh, reflects is is reflected uh, through this timeline. Let me just briefly say what Documenta is. It is, according to the New York Times, the world's most prestigious art show. Uh, if you haven't heard of Documenta, you might have heard of the Venice Biennale. It, they, they occupy basically the same prestigious status in the art world. It is a, a festival that happens, that is mounted in the city of Kassel in Germany every five years. I believe it started in the 1950s. And typically, it, it generates, whenever there is a documenter every five years, it generates a lot of debate and discussion in the arts, in the arts press. Uh, I think what was significant about this year was that there was virtually no debate about art and plenty of debate and, and even more angry uh, exchanges uh, about anti-Semitism. Why was this? The theme of this year's documenta was the global south. In other words, art from the developing world and how that art reflects the sort of post-colonial context of these countries. Um, and the documenta management, and by the way, documenta is a, is a festival that, that is directly funded by the federal government in Germany. So documenta's management are basically, their salaries are being paid by the, by the government. Um, it was their decision to appoint a collective of Indian of Indonesian artists called Ruan Grupa to curate this year's show. Um, and so in January 2022, six months before the show opened, we had uh, the first revelations of, of support in this 
collective Rwand group of this Indonesian group for BDS. Uh, declarations by its individ individual members uh, in support of BDS. Uh, reports that, met, that that its its members had refused to exhibit their work in Israel or alongside Israeli artists. So so pretty much faithfully following the guidelines of the cultural uh, boycott of of Israel. Now when this when these revelations emerged, there was minimal English language coverage. I mean, it was mainly in the arts media, uh, nothing in the general press, and I think we were the only uh, Jewish paper to to cover it. And I remember. Uh, saying to my colleagues at the time, you know, this is interesting, this art festival is a big deal. I said, either this is going to be a major, either this is just going to dissipate in the next few days, or we've got a major scandal on our hands, and this is going to be an ongoing story. And it turned out that the uh, the second uh, supposition, my second supposition was the, was the correct one. So from January till about May, uh, there are, there is more and more attention paid to the fact that this Rwan Grupa group has these ties to BDS and you start seeing expressions of concern from 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 the Jewish community in Germany Josef Schuster the head of the Central Council of German Jews comes out in this period at least two or three times with statements uh, expressing concern about Documenta as I said this doesn't get really reported in the English language media it's still too obscure I think for international media outlets but it is faithfully reported in the in the German press. And I think this is one of the things that I was really struck by in covering Documenta was that that every development in this festival, and believe me, there were quite a few, each development was reported uh, in, 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 in the German press. So I think what one thing we can certainly conclude is, is today's Germany has a massive problem, a massive problem with resurgent anti-Semitism, but it also has a news media that is actually pretty very much in tune with what's going on. And I saw really no evidence that people were trying to excuse it or, or, or play it down. The next, I think, significant development took place in May 2022, when Felix Klein, who is the federal government's commissioner, uh, for combating anti-Semitism. I think a post he's had for the, the last four years. So Klein came out and gave an interview where he expressed uh, concern about the BDS links and grave disappointment that there were no, um, uh, that there were no uh, 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 Israeli artists being exhibited at, at Documenta. And again, that was widely reported in the German press and the the, the outlets that I've mentioned here, the uh, Zeit, uh, the Süddeutsche Zeitung, uh, are really just a handful of, of, of the outlets that, that reported this. One month later, the show opens and we get our first, and I would say probably the biggest controversy of this whole sorry story. Um, it was, I think, about a week after the show opened, uh, People were visitors were sort of wandering through the exhibition, and somebody noticed that there was an enormous mural in the center of Castle that had that contained two nakedly anti-Semitic images. These were images that drew on neo-traditional anti-Semitism, anti-Zionist anti-Semitism, and Holocaust abuse. The mural was called People's Justice. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about artistic merit. I'll, I'll, I'll simply say that I think the purpose of this mural was to give an artistic rendition of the bifurcation of the world and the world's peoples into oppressed and oppressors. Uh, no surprises for guessing which side the Jews were on. And so, of course, in this mural, there were two, fi two, two figures uh, that are meant to symbolize uh, all this oppression. Uh, one of them had a uh, the face of a hook nose, uh, had a face with a with a with a hook nose, um, and wore a hat, a, a traditional fedora hat, the kind of hat that you associate with Haredi Jews, uh, embossed with the word with the letters SS. Um, in, in other words, a reference to the Nazi paramilitary organization. The same mural contained another figure uh, with a, a soldier with the face of a pig and wearing a helmet marked with the words Mossad. Uh, 
So essentially, it's a perfect storm of anti-Semitic memes in that one mural. Jews as Nazis, uh, Jews as oppressors, uh, Jews as these kind of otherworldly, ugly figures conspiring uh, against the general health of, of society. Uh, the response, and all of this was, was, was pretty faithfully reported, the response initially was to actually put masking tape over these two offending images but leave the mural in place and then i think at some point later in that day um you know some uh, removal removals men arrived and 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 took the the mural down but i think the the emergence of this people's justice mural was really a transformative event for media coverage of this event uh you had the english light language coverage was was widespread you had your first report in 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 the new york times uh, there was wall to wall coverage in the arts media and there was pretty shocked reporting. Remember, Germany, of course, is the land of the Holocaust. So this was there was pretty shocked reporting of this of this development in 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 all of the, the major German news outlets. And then the story really starts to develop legs as a result of people's justice. So later that month, Olaf Scholz, the chancellor of Germany, who I understand is a big art lover and has never missed a, a documenter, uh, decided to nix an official visit because of all these, these controversies and his distaste for the fact that anti-Semitic artwork was being displayed there. Um, Schultz's, while People's Justice did get extensive English language coverage, uh, there was much less attention on Schultz's decision not to go. It may be that you know, the, the concept of overkill is still uh, a, a live one in, in news coverage. And it may be that uh, uh, news editors decided to really stagger the reporting of, of, of Documenta because there were any number of developments, you know, on, a, on every two or three days, there was something that, that could have been reported. So Schultz's visit didn't get the kind of coverage in, in the international media that the People's Justice Mural did, but it did get extensive coverage in the German press. Um, by contrast, a demand a month later by the by the Bundestag for an investigation of the documenta management was barely mentioned in English and wasn't really reported in the German press. I think because at the point that it appeared, it was too abstract. But then a few days later, the coverage intensified yet again, because in the weight of all this pressure, uh, the first head rolled. And of course, when heads roll in the middle of a scandal, that is something that excites the media. And in this case, the head that rolled was that of Sabine Shawman, uh, the director of the Documenta Festival, who had, in my view, been spectacularly inept throughout the entire process. Uh, she decided to call it a day and she resigned. And then you really get an explosion of coverage in the English language press. And of course, all the issues around uh, that 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 have 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 crystallized in the Documenta Festival, the the support for BDS, the appearance of of anti-Semitic tropes, and critically, the inability of uh, the management team behind this festival, all educated German citizens, all people who have grown up in schools where the Holocaust has been taught as a subject, they were absolutely clueless when it came to dealing with anti-Semitism from quote unquote the 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 global south and um again these rather complex things were all reflected in in the media coverage some of it you know in the english language uh, selection of the english language outlets that reported it the guardian there was a long piece the washington post uh the bbc and then of course all the all the top uh uh, uh outlets in in germany Moving into August, we get yet another anti-Semitic mural, this time not as not quite as 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 appalling as as people's justice. But in this case, uh, what we were seeing was a figure with a hooked nose wearing something that looks suspicious, suspicious, suspiciously like a a kippah um, and proffering. Uh, large bags of money that was really the the kind of the 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 uh, what hooked you uh proffering large bags of money wearing a very crafty smile and trying to persuade these very skeptical upright non-jews uh to take his money and and they clearly don't want to uh 
so yet again, this association of Jews with financial corruption, uh, classic anti-Semitic trope, it appears here at, at Documenta. Again, not much coverage in the English language, but faithfully reported in the in the uh, German press. Um, there really isn't, as, as the story goes on, the international press kind of loses interest, but the German press sticks doggedly with this story. So in the middle of August, we get yet another controversy. And this is around an installation called the Tokyo Reels. The Tokyo Reels is basically a series of black and white films. I mean, it, it, it you know, Dull doesn't even begin to describe this uh, uh, as an artistic offering. Uh, it consists of, of, of black and white reels of Japanese Marxist activists in the 1970s and 1980s discussing various solidarity strategies uh, with, with the Palestinians. But, um, you know, as dull as it was, the people who sat through the Tokyo reels, one observer described it as bursting. That was the word he used, bursting with anti-Semitism, uh, notions of Zionism, uh, a, a hand in hand with capitalism, of Zionist interests controlling uh, Western governments, and of the Palestinians of uh, being at the mercy of this uh, this this uh, juggernaut of a of a of a conspiracy. Um, and of course, the significance of this is that is that the Japanese far left is hasn't simply intervened discursively in the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Uh, what the Tokyo reels brought to mind most of all were the terrorist attacks of the Japanese Red Army uh, against Israelis during the 1970s. And some of you may remember, I want to say, I'm sorry, I forget the year, I think it was 1973, that the Japanese Red Army uh, launched a gun attack at Lod Airport near Tel Aviv uh, and killed dozens of people, in, including an Israeli uh, Nobel Prize winner uh, during that attack. So uh, you know, the, 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 there is a tangible relationship between this uh, installation that was on display in, in at Documenta and this appalling act of, of, of terrorism visited on Israelis by the Japanese uh, Red Army. Uh, and again, that story is, of course, uh, extensively reported in, in the German press and also starts uh, generates uh, throughout this time. There are columns on the opinion pages and most of the time that that, that is, is expressing absolute disbelief, disgust at what is manifesting at Documenta. Uh, we get to September, the show closes, um, and uh, in some ways, the last word goes to the Indonesian curators, to Anne Grupa. They issue a statement, surprise, surprise, they reject all the criticism, and uh, you know they exhibit that wonderful characteristic uh, of, of people who get accused of anti-Semitism, of becoming themselves insulted. How dare you call us anti-Semitic? Don't you know what a hurtful accusation that is? So essentially, uh, you know, playing playing the victim card um, in response to an accusation of anti-Semitism, which is a, a a tactic we have seen uh, time and again uh, in the last uh, 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 twenty years. Um, and this closure results in a long feature in the New York Times. Uh, written by its art critic, Jason Farrago. Um, and I want to just basically, uh, I want to quote what, what he said here, and then I want to briefly discuss it. I know I'm acutely aware that we are running out of time here. Uh, so what he says is, this was therefore less an exhibition than what my colleague Siddhartha Mitter, reviewing the show in June, adeptly called a whole vibe. Vibing was its aim and its downfall too. Documenta 15 by design militated against its own viewing. The viewer is obsolete. You can read it in the catalogue because the real work of the show was not the stuff on the walls, but the hanging out around it. In other words, the actual content and form of these Palestinian agitational movies from the 70s and 80s mattered less than the new collective group that brought them here and the other artists who came together to vibe with them. Collectivity was treated as an end in itself. We were here as Ruan Grupa exhorted us to, quote, make friends, not art. Well, that sounds fun, but what if your friend's art sucks? This controversial documenter was, to speak of what visitors actually saw in Castle, the safest and most boring of this century, 
as evidenced by the almost non-existent discussion around any of the art on view. Now, that is a beautifully written and very damning um, review by an art critic looking at the art. But I think what's what, 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 if we take a step back from that, what is significant to me is that when the New York Times decided to treat its readers to a reflection on Documenta, they reflected on how art and artistic integrity was compromised uh, by this year's festival, rather than the more obvious point, which is, you know, in the land of the Holocaust, we saw uh, across a three month art festival, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, episodes of anti-Semitic artworks on display. Um, and that, I think, is uh, it, it's certainly a discussion that occurred in the German press. It is not something that occurred in the in the international uh, press. Uh, OK, I, I want to uh, I, I want to just conclude uh, by, you know, uh, explaining the, the documenta uh, case study for me, as I said, is, is important, both because it was an ongoing story. It, it was it was a story that developed across three months. It wasn't something that took place in a week and it wasn't something that people will forget about in a week. It has left a, a lasting legacy. And it also reflected at least three of the four uh, categories of anti-Semitic discourse that I uh, identified earlier. And that basically takes me to that conclusion, my conclusion, because I think we've had a, a pain debate in our community of, of scholars, journalists, activists, observers about whether anti-Semitism has been mainstreamed, about whether it's crossed from the periphery of public discourse into the center. And I think that when we study media coverage, coverage on the news, in the news sections of the news organizations about anti-Semitism, we're seeing that there is the 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 in terms of awareness of anti-semitism thanks to the volume and degree of media coverage there's more awareness um now than another time since the second world war and i think one of the key questions coming out of this and perhaps something that we'll we'll discuss in the q a is is whether this awareness and the increasing frequency of anti-semitic outrages and the way in which uh mentions of anti-semitism in on media platforms have a real world outcome in the in the in that they they in they inspire more violence against Jews. The question for me is whether this will now generate a, a counter reaction and drive anti-Semitism back to the periphery, as has happened on a few occasions since the Second World War, or whether now we are looking at a process that is set to escalate. So with that, I apologize for uh, going over my allotted time.